Welcome everyone. I invite you to settle in for the next 75 minutes for the third webinar of the ABA Center on Children and the Law celebrating Reunification Month. The previous webinars, Experiences in the Reunification Process and What Child Welfare Agencies Can Do to Support Reunification can be found on the ABA National Reunification Month webpage, along with a plethora of other resources. Please use the Q&A function for questions. Your questions are being curated by my colleagues, Jay Rajaraman and Chauncey Strong. They will respond as time allows and we have reserved time for questions at the conclusion of the presentations today. As we begin today's webinar, I cannot help but reflect on two significant recent events that has put family integrity front and center in our collective work. First, the Burkina decision on June 15th highlighted that family integrity is significant and must be protected. Second, on June 20th, the Congressional Black Caucus held a special order hour highlighting Reunification Month and its significance. Members spoke passionately about the need to honor family integrity, especially for families of color. Remember, reunification matters and reunification happens. With that context, Today's agenda includes a presentation on the Quality Improvement Center Family-Centered Reunification, which will be followed by remarks from Commissioner Rebecca Jones Gaston. The commissioner will be joining us at 2 p.m. and we will give way to her remarks when she joins. At this time, I want to introduce Darquita Fletcher, who is the Project Director for the Family-Centered Reunification Quality Improvement Center who along with Christine Monroe, Program Administrator at the Department of Job and Family Services, Ohio, and Amy Spriggs, Service Region Clinical Associate at the Department for Community-Based Services, Kentucky, will be presenting to us on the reformation work being undertaken by the new Quick R. Darquita? Thank you so much, Beverly. I'm going to share my screen. Sorry about that. Uh, do you mind, Beverly, just to advance the screen for me? Thank you so much. And the next slide, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again. My name is Darquita Fletcher. I'm the project director for the Quality Improvement Center on Family Center Reunification. And as you can see, uh, we have a team of members from our um, Innovations Institute with the UConn School of Social Work. We also work with a team of partners from different national organizations to help inform the work that we do. Next slide. The purpose of the Quick R is to disseminate federal dollars from the Children's Bureau to agencies nationally to reform child welfare. When selected, and we have selected five sites, uh, they have a federal contractual obligation to produce data and improve, and improve the field. The purpose of the Quick R is to support the timely, stable, and lasting reunification of families by preserving, nurturing, and strengthening parent-child relationships and supportive community connections and resources including through the meaningful engagement of parents, foster families, youth, alumni of foster care, and other stakeholders in the community. The Quick R provides TA to the local implementation sites. So we provide this TA to the local implementation sites to produce manuals for replication and other child welfare agencies. So we, this Quick R is a um, five-year process where we, uh, the pro, we help the, pro, the sites implement programs, it's a five year time frame, and we do some rigorous evaluation on the programs that they're implementing. So at the end of the five years, the goal is to um, create manuals for replication in other child welfare agencies and build evidence-based knowledge on effective engagement services and interventions to support family-centered reunification for, with foster youth and foster care and their families. 
The goals of the Quick R is to create systemic change to promote comprehensive, holistic family-centered unification services and supports. Um, during this time, children will be supported in achieving normalcy and stability while experiencing foster care episodes. The needs of children and parents will be comprehensively assessed and addressed and for communities to identify and develop comprehensive array of services, localized family supports to build protective factors. We want foster care programs, foster families to serve as a support to not solely a substitute for parents and biological families of origin. And we also need to provide a space for families to thrive within their community of origin. So again, we are working in a, we have a family-centered practice approach, which is a way of working with families both formally and informally across systems to enhance their capacity to care for and protect their children. As you all know, working in a child welfare agency and also in this field, work with families cannot be done in a silo. So the family-centered practice approach really um, engages everyone and all the resources that we need to help families successfully reunify. Next slide, please. So we have, like I said, five local implementation sites. And I'm so happy because two of them are here with us to talk a little about a little bit about their program that they're implementing, and I'm going to pass it over to Amy Spriggs. Amy? Hello, everyone. As Starquita said, I'm here to talk about Family Recovery Court in Kentucky. The next slide. So Family Recovery Court is a court-based voluntary program that's designed to assist families who are involved with child protective services due to active substance misuse. It's a collaborative partnership with Child Protective Services, the local community mental health center who provides additional services and additional case management, and the administrative office of the courts where judges volunteer their time to informally meet with participants weekly. Parents are eligible for the program if Child Protective Services files a petition bringing the family before the court on the basis of substance misuse. Our goals are to have safe, timely and lasting reunification or to prevent out-of-home care. We want to decrease intergenerational A scores and we want to strengthen families improving their overall health and independence. Family recovery court is phase-based with each phase focusing on a different area of need. Phase one is all about sobriety and the completion of substance abuse treatment. We want to engage individuals where they are and assist them with getting to treatment so they can build their sober community and that foundation so they're ready for phase two which is all about parenting. Every participant completes a trauma-informed parenting group to address past trauma experiences and how that's impacted their parenting now. If they're separated from the children, we wanna increase parenting time during this phase with the hope that we can save for reading at that. In phase three, it's all about family treating the family as a whole. We wanna ensure that we provide in-home reunification services or outpatient family treatment. We also have a life skills curriculum during this phase to build long-term stability by addressing money management, health, stable housing, or income. And throughout our program, we have milestone work. An example of this is our taking care of me assignment, where you have to get a primary care doctor, you have to go to the dentist, you have to learn to take care of yourself so that you can take care of your children. Also throughout the program, we families can obtain sober butts for attending treatment or attending AA meetings. They can change, to turn these bucks in for actual gift cards to Walmart or Kroger. And also throughout our program, we have learning experiences. These are given if people are struggling in the program. It may be that they have to incre increase how many times they go to AA, or they may have to write or verbally tell us the importance of treatment. The program is approximately 12 to 18 months, but the primary goal is successfully reunifying parents with their children and maintaining family autonomy. Some of our successes so far is reunification has occurred within 10 months versus our statewide 25 months. 67 children have been returned to their parents. 16 have remained in the home. And this week alone, our fifth healthy baby not prenatally exposed was born. We've also been able to expand into rural areas with the partners partner to the VOA. I'll turn it back now to Dark Vita. Thank you, Amy. And now I'd like to introduce Christine Monroe, who will talk about the Ohio program, POP. 
Hello, everyone. You can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, so POP stands for Partnering with Ohio Parents, and um, it is a it is it's an adaption of the Iowa Parent Partner Approach, which is an evidence based parent partner approach. Um, we are starting this in Ohio with three counties. So we have Fairfield and Knox counties, and um, Fairfield is adjacent to Franklin County, which is um, the metropolitan Columbus area and is a fairly large county. Um, and Knox is a little bit northeast of Columbus and a bit more rural. So um, we actually have two sites through the Quick R, one with our Franklin County and the other with Fairfield and Knox. And so um, the way parent, the program works is clients are linked with a par parent partner. Um, and so the parent partners are people who have um, previously worked with the child welfare system, had a child removed from their care. And um, I believe all of ours have success, successfully reunified with their children, but that's not a requirement to be a parent partner. Um, you can have, you know, maybe someone else receive legal custody. And um, however, the issues that led to children's services involvement have been resolved, so they would um, still be eligible. And so the parent partners, they provide social support to the parent, guide them through the um, children's services system. I know all of us who have worked in the system, even, you know, years later are still learning new things about how things work. Um, it's very confusing when you're first encountering the system. So um, they can really provide that firsthand guidance on how, on, you know, what to do and how to make the system work for them. Um, they provide a lot of support with access, as, excuse me, accessing community resources and services, um, work on how to have a healthy relationship with your caseworker, with service providers, with court personnel, and really work very hard with them to um, help them advocate for themselves and their needs and their children's needs. Um, we work with a vendor. Um, we issued an RFP to um, obtain a vendor for who would have provide us with a parent partner manager and then that entity also would hire our parent partners. Um, so our vendor is special, excuse me, specialized alternatives for family and youth or SAFI. We have an amazing um, manager for our parent partner, Sharice Penn, and um, she has done an uh, she's just wonderful. Um, but we so the contract was issued at the beginning of 2022 with SAFI. And um, uh, it took us a few months to find some parent partners. Um, you know, it is obviously a very specialized population, but we did fire, hire our first two parent partners on July 18th of 2022. Um, so they are about to celebrate their year anniversary at SAFI. So that's very exciting. Um, and then, you know, those parent partners would refer to us help it help basically it was just kind of like a snowball effect and um we are our, our ninth parent partner will start next week we currently have eight parent partners who are um, fully trained and actively working with clients and um so as i said we really started rolling with the program last summer um, and the parent partners have really been involved in the development of the program every step of the way. We meet with the Quick R team monthly um, and then we also meet monthly with our state team. And so the parent partners are in all of those meetings unless they have an unavoidable conflict, they contribute, their voice is heard and it's been um, really helpful just to have their perspective in guiding the development of the program. Um, one example of um, how they have assisted is what IPPA, the Iowa approach, traditionally the parent partner does not remain involved after the um, child reunifies with the parent. But as we were talking in our group, we were like, that doesn't really make sense. Um, you know, so the parent partners agree that it really, you know, that re period of reunification is you know, a vital time where a parent can need additional support. So with our program, we are deviating a bit from the model and continuing to provide support after reunification in hopes of assisting with prevention of um, reentry into care as well as future maltreatment. Um, and our 
our group, our program, we don't have any regularly scheduled meetings that do not include the parent partners. Um, as far as outcomes, we're still really early in the process. Um, our program, we began taking referrals because we had to go through, you know, a bunch of training and things like that in October for Fairfield and Knox, and then not until February for Franklin. Um, so, so we're still in the early phases. We were currently serving around 30 families, which is pretty exciting. Only, you know, nine months into the program. Um, we, let's see. Oh, and we've had several reunifications over the last month or two. And so that's been really fun and, um, you know, really show the parent partners, um, you know, just what it looks like when the families are unified. And then another huge benefit of the parent partners um, has been their participation in efforts in Ohio for systemic change. Um, so of course, I'm sure most states are always actively working on improvement, but um, they, like for example, we have a, per, we're working to implement, um, it's called evident change to create a community resource guide um, to hopefully avoid child welfare and children's services involvement and where referral sources could potentially access community resources instead of the agents, children's services agency. So we have parent partners serving on that committee. They are serving on our strengthening relationship, um, relationships between primary families and resource families group. So that's been really exciting. Um, and they will, I don't think they've attended their first meeting yet, but they will too will be serving as members of our um, Supreme Court of Ohio Child Abuse, Neglect, Dependency, and Neglect, neglect and Dependency subcommittees. So that'll be um, really good for them to kind of hopefully influence some of that court work. Um, and it's really been just such a pleasure to work with the SAFI team, the parent partners. Um, their stories are, they're so inspiring. Um, and so we're really excited to continue the work, hope to be able to expand it in the future and, um, you know, and see what the evaluation shows us. And just on a personal note, this project has just really highlighted the value of people with lived experience in our work and what an impact they could make. Um, so I'm just really grateful to be a part of it. Thank you. And I think we'll send it back to you, Dirk Guida. Thank you so much, Christine. And thank you, um, Amy. Uh, I definitely have to just make one comment that uh, uh, having parent partners inform this work that we're doing is just amazing to, in this, to see in this implementation process. Um, so one of the other sites that we do have is a site located in um, Montana. It's called the uh, Confederate Salish and Kootenai Tribe, and they are implementing the, um, the START program. Next slide. So uh, like I said, they're implementing the National START program with the intention of making it a sustainable social service practice for CSKT. This is a child welfare based intervention for families with a young child, zero to five, including infants with prenatal substance exposure. It has an intensive and coordinated service delivery between child welfare, SUD, and mental health treatment providers. One of the things that's really exciting about um, CSKT implementing the START program is that, like I said, at the end of these, um, at the end of the five year process, we will have one of the first uh, tribes that will implement the START program, which will be will be able to inform uh, how other tribes can also implement this program within their um, within their child welfare organization. So we're really excited about um, this being the first tribe to do this. Next slide, please. And the last um, site we have is in New York, which is the Moreau County Department of Human Services. They are implementing the PREPARE program, which is a combination of Circle of Security and Babies in Me. And with this program, which is a 12-week program that they're implementing, it operationalized concepts learned in workshops in a live setting with immediate feedback, uh, utilizes a group model, parents model, teach, and support each other, Parents discover new ways to understand links between feelings, behaviors, and actions. And one of the significant things about this program is that once the, par the parents are um, attending the workshops on a weekly basis, but 
right after they learn these skills, they're able to practice these skills um, with their children who are placed in foster care immediately after um, learning the skills in their group. So this is a really good pair between learning some skills, learning attachment, working through some of um, the trauma, but also transitioning into visiting with their children and also practicing those specific skills that they're learning. And this is in real time. Next slide, please. So each local implementation site is working with us to implement evidence-based, evidence-informed or promising interventions or approaches that include comprehensive, culturally responsive, trauma-informed and individualized services for youth in foster care with the goal of reunification or, and their parents or caregivers. The intervention purveyors are either assisting with implementation process to create the evidence basis for this work while ensuring the fidelity of the model or they're developing fidelity to use evidence for the model. We also have an evaluation team that works with each site to create evaluation and fidelity tools for data collection, which will assess the intervention's effectiveness, sustainability, and outcomes. Evaluation and data collection is a requirement for each site and is the core component of the program. Again, like I said, um, the goal is to create, to have these programs manualized so that this work can inform the field. The quick, R the quick R evaluates each site individually while incorporating multiple cross-site evaluation components to assess the best practices implemented throughout the sites. The evaluation includes site-specific and cross-site processes and outcome evaluation activities tailored to cultural and community factors as appropriate, as appropriate. So one of the things that we're looking at across sites because we have peer mentors and parent with lived experience informing the program and or working within these programs. And that's one of the things that we'll, uh, we'll examine across site because the research says that when parents are helped by other parents with lived experience, uh, it helps the reunification process. Also, as a part of the application process, um, all the sites were required to um, go through a readiness assessment, which is called an institutional analysis. So the institutional analysis is a, a way of examining an issue that, organi that, or that an organization is experiencing or trying to resolve. Um, the eyes were conducted by a train and a diverse team that was including our team um, at Innovations and um, that examined systemic issues or barriers within each organizational system. Each site received an IA report summarizing data analysis and recommendations. And they are using these recommendations to inform the implementation plan. One of the reasons why we felt like this was a, a really important requirement for each site is because sometimes programs are implemented in, in certain organizations and then there's barriers that come up, right? Sometimes barriers that you don't even know or sometimes systems are not even aware of um, and so we wanted to make sure that we lined the sites up, we helped them to accomplish as much um, success as possible in implementing that program. So we found a lot of barriers, uh, but we also found a tremendous amount of strengths from each agency, and they were able to build on that, but also working on decreasing those barriers. Next slide, please. Some of the strengths we found across sites were that prevention um, these organizations had prevention programs for families. They were committed to improving racial disparities within the child welfare agency. The leadership was committed to continue growth to improve um, practice with families. Supervisors and workers believed reunification was a priority. And there was a focus on placing children with relative caregivers when removal occurred. Next slide, please. And then we saw some themes, which I'm pretty sure people who are working in the field, they're definitely familiar with some of these themes. So some of them was uh, families needed additional support around reunification, including families and in planning and decision-making, families of color experience disparities in child welfare, um, additional parent-child relationships need additional support, and also additional family-centered reunification and trauma-informed practices are needed. And so the, with the themes that we found within the agency and we included, included these themes and recommendations in the report, the sites have done a, a tremendous job in uh, working towards uh, decreasing these barriers or even eliminating them. Next slide, please. 
So we have a collaborative, uh, a quality learning collaborative, and it's just our practice and our approach, which creates an opportunity for sites to, pre to present cross-site learning, adapt best practices across multiple settings, and develop modifications and organizations that promote the delivery of effective interventions and services. We actually just had our second annual uh, collabor learning, quality learning collaborative in Kentucky, where we have, um, every year we have experts from the field, come out and talk to the sites. We have guest speakers and this time for sites to get together, talk about what's working and not working in the implementation, share success stories, share some barriers, but eat, and also learn from each other because sometimes they're experiencing the same thing or they have the same successes. And so they can work through that together. The QLC provides a learning environment to facilitate discussions around their knowledge and apply to practice by creating a structure in which interested organizations can quickly learn from each other and from, recon and from other recognized experts in topic areas where they want to make improvements. So every month we meet with the, um, the local implementation sites. We host monthly learning opportunities and webinars. And also what's important for everyone to know is that we post these resources and webinars on our website. So some of the topics that we have reviewed with our, our local implementation sites are implementation science, program evaluation, family youth engagement, collaborative practice model, uh, cultural considerations and adaptations. And we also have a, we also, we also created an online e-learning on family center reunification in which participants can obtain continuing education credits when they take the course. And so we will continue to add to our resources as we continue the quick. And so um, we didn't want to wait until the end of the quick to start producing um, resources that would help the field or inform the field. We wanted to make sure that we uh, put this out here that so that anyone can access it if it was helpful. The quick R also provides um, TA to our partners through our partner organizations and our consulting pool comprised of ex comprised of national experts, including those with experience working with culturally diverse communities. So again, we have a team of people and a team of consultants, a team of experts that we work with to inform the site. So anytime any one of our sites, they may say, well, we wanna learn about marketing or we wanna learn about um, hiring and recruiting parent peer partners, either we'll provide that to you ourselves because from our pool of experts or we'll go out and find the experts to help uh, to provide that TA to our sites. Next slide. We do have available quick R resources. Again, um, if you log onto our website, we have learning opportunities that um, anyone can view. We have a page for tribal resources. So anyone who's working with tribes, we have a, um, a resource page for that. And then we also have general resources and topics, as you can see, one of them is the power of affirming language and finding strength, addressing disparities and over-representation of Black, Latino, Indigenous children and families of color and child welfare, enhancing family-centered practice through a trauma-informed perspective, a parent's perspective on family-centered reunification practice. And then, like I said before, we also have our family-centered reunification training. So thank you so much uh, for listening, for having us. Uh, we really appreciate the time uh, for you all to learn about the work that we're doing. But also this is really exciting because this is the first time we're presenting on this national level so that um, people will get excited. Look at our, um, our web and look at our website, but just really get excited about um, the work that we're doing and also starting to look at what you may be interested in and replicating once we do uh, manualize these programs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darquita. Thank you, Christine and Amy. I am gonna ask if our curators of our questions have any questions. So if Darquita and Kristen, Christine and Amy can join me on camera, and if there are questions, Jay or Chauncey, that have come in, um, our panelists are available um, to start answering some of those questions. 
Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for such an excellent presentation. And um, I'll just start with some of the questions asked about how this program is actually created, how were the sites selected, and what were your requirements in selecting these sites? So um, we actually received the funding from the Children's Bureau. So that was the federal funding we received from the Children's Bureau. Bureau. So the Innovations Institute received the funding. Once we received the funding, we um, put out an RFP or, or for people, for different agencies to apply for the program. So we had a team, our, our team of consultants and experts that um, were able to score all of our applications. So we have like this, application matrix kind of process and whoever scored the highest, um, we selected those sites. So um, we're, we were excited about the sites that we selected um, and we're, happy, we're excited about continuing to work with them. And how, um, was there any separate funding and how did you develop the parent partner or parent mentor programs for each of the sites? So some of the models, like the IPPA model, uh, that's um, hiring parent partners are required. And then as we started to continue the work, and also, let me just backtrack, um, making sure that parents, parents' voice were, and parents were included in the implementation process of the program was a requirement in our application. But some of the models that are, um, that the sites are implementing do require hiring parent peer mentors. And then some of our sites just saw the value of having parent peer mentors inform the program and decided to hire um, a parent peer mentor for their program. Amy or Christine, do you wanna to speak to any of that? Um, as far as funding, Ohio has been blessed to have Governor Mike DeWine, who's very committed to child welfare. So we, have um, some state funding to help assist with our program in addition to the funding from the Quick R. Um, so that is um, the main source of our funding. Um, but the Quick R provides the majority, but we do have some additional state funding to help support it. And for Kentucky, we have the Clip R funding, and we did have some legislative dollars as well that was given to our community partner, which is seven counties. And we saw the value in meeting a parent mentor. And so we we sought out to, to do that. We actually are in the middle of trying to hire a second parent mentor. And um, rece received a question just following on uh, the parent mentor question. Um, as you can imagine, um, there's always a concern about programs, especially through state and federal funded programs about, is this really parent-led, family-led developed? And so uh, there's a question about what format and framework is utilized to ensure that, if you could speak to that. So um, Ohio's program is based on the Iowa Parent Partner pro approach. So they have various manuals um, that really guide how the approach works. The um, the vendor for the Iowa Parent Partner Approach, Children and Families of Iowa, they have worked with us to um, to really they provided our initial training and done like train the trainers to really ensure that we are um, you know assimilating to their model and ensuring that there's parent voice and input and so on. Um, so. That's really our framework. There's, I think all the different Iowa guides are publicly available um, and we really tried to stay um, as close to that model as possible. Thank you all for your questions and thank you to our quick R panelists. And I'm going to turn our conversation over to Prudence Carr, our executive director at the ABA Center on Children and the Law. Thanks so much, Beverly. I have the honor of getting to introduce our next speaker. Um, and I just wanted to, to do a, a sort of transition by thanking uh, Darquita and Amy and Christine so much for not only the presentation today, but so much of the work that you're doing across the country in collaboration with the federal government around 
developing and designing um, really enhanced approaches to reunification services and, and family reunification. Um, and that's a good segue to um, sort of the larger context of this webinar, which is about how the federal government is investing in and raising up reunification. Um, and so I'm sure everyone on our webinar today knows um, Commissioner Jones Gaston, but I'll do a very quick introduction uh, just to, to orient um, you all to our next speaker. Um, Commissioner uh, Jones Gaston is the Commissioner of the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And she is no stranger to reunification celebrations. Uh, for those of you who were able to join our last webinar at the beginning of the month, she comes most recently from being the Child Welfare Director for the state of Oregon. And I know um, many people had a chance to hear about all the great work that's happening in Oregon around reunification and family supports and parent partners in particular, um, much of which um, happened initially under Rebecca's leadership. Um, she's also no stranger to the importance of family bonds. So Rebecca talks a lot and it's in her official profile. So I thought I would raise it up here about her role as a very proud mother of two young adults and um, has always been an inspiration um, for those of us working in this space um, in the way that she talks about family. So without further ado, Rebecca, we're thrilled to have you here today. Thank you so much for the work that you have committed to this community and this um, space for many, many years, and especially for the work you're doing right now in the administration. Thank you, Prudence, and thank you everyone on here. Uh, it is uh, such an honor to be here, and of course, you know, I, I got the ask and was, I was slow in responding, but not because I wasn't interested in being a part of this, just because I haven't quite managed my juggling of uh, my schedule and and uh, being responsive, but uh, reunification month um, is an excellent opportunity, and I know you've heard some really good examples, um, you know, throughout today and throughout the month that are happening across the country that you all are leading in a variety of different ways. But I wanted to really just um, offer. Uh, my thoughts and encouragement for us to just continuing continue to do to do this work. I think um, uh, many uh, folks know uh, my story and my connection to to child welfare is very personal, um, and I uh, share that quite a bit. And that's what brought me to the work. And so I've had a chance to to work in a variety of different roles um, in the child welfare space. Um, and uh, I've seen the evolution um, in, in many ways of where we've come um, with our system because you know, we didn't, when I first started, we weren't talking about reunification. We were talking about pretty singularly long-term foster care or adoption. Um, and so I um, uh, love that there's been some evolution and we haven't gotten far enough. Um, by any means, uh, you know, I think there, uh, the, there's lots of focus and we talk about prevention and, and I don't want to lose that, right? And so when I talk about prevention, I talk about prevention and preservation. Um, and, and that for me applies to the whole spectrum of time of, of a family um, and their interaction with child welfare. Our first desire is to not have anyone involved with child welfare. I think that's number one goal. And I think what we're striving for and needing to acknowledge that, you know, our system actually wasn't built to do that very well, if at all. And so thinking about what are the things that we need to do differently. And we've got some opportunities um, that have happened over the last several years, but again, it's not enough because <laughs> If we're only talking about family first, we're talking about prevention of foster care placement. But I think all of us on here are talking about, we want kids to be okay. And in order for kids to be okay, their families have to be okay and their communities have to be okay. And that child welfare actually isn't the solution or answer to, to any of that. And so how do we partner differently and collaborate differently and think about um, shifting priorities and, and opportunities to work with the spaces and places that exist 
um, long before a family um, comes known to a child welfare system, but it also is with, you know, our partners in identifying who, what is actually needed. And we can't do that without kind of humbling ourselves as the system and actually listening to those who've experienced um, the impact of having a knock on the door from child welfare and having, having the devastating um, traumatic experience of having children separated from your care as a parent. I just, I, in reflecting on my own personal experience, and I don't actually talk about this very often, but you know, I was a young single mother. I was 21. I thought I'd I thought I knew lots of things. I knew nothing about parenting. Um, um, but what I did know is I was bound and determined to not find myself connected to child welfare because I knew what it would, what it could do. And so was hyper vigilant about, um, you know, making sure that I didn't interact with any sort of governmental system, be it for support assistance, any of that. And um, that's, that's an impact to your spirit of trying to make sure that you're protecting yourself from these entities that you don't even know where they exist, how they exist, but you know, you don't want to interact with them. And so, um, you know, that, <laughs> that just isn't how we want to um, how we want families to um, be able to be. We want families who are in crisis, who are experiencing momentary challenges, who might even just have questions about what are some options and possibilities to feel free to actually seek those supports and help um, freely without the fear of uh, a punitive system getting involved and making decisions um, that you feel like you lose control of. Um, I remember getting an, uh, uh, a, a call from my best friend's aunt at the time, and she was always good at this perfect timing. Talk about village support. She would call me up on a Friday afternoon and she would say, Hey, you know, I was wondering if I could have John for the weekend. And John was my son. And I was like, why, yes, you can. <laughs> and not knowing that I needed that kind of break and that support. Um, but I trusted her and all those sort of things. And then one time he got sick when he was um, with her. And I didn't have a phone at the time. And so the police come banging on my door in the middle of the night to tell me my son was on the way to the hospital and the police, I didn't have a car either. The police officer gave me a ride to the hospital and that whole kind of 20, 30 minute ride, I got chastised for being irresponsible, for not making better decisions for myself, for um, not being accessible um, in case something happened to my child. And um, I remember that feeling very much um, and I can only imagine that it is a very, very small portion of what it feels like to have someone show up and have and and make the decision that you're not able to actually care for your child. And so we want to minimize and ultimately figure out how do we prevent that from happening ever. If families do get and families and children do get involved with the child welfare system. We have an obligation as a system to actually have our intervention be meaningful in keeping families connected and ultimately bringing them back together. That hasn't been how our system's built to work. Our system, by way of a funding stream, by way of our statutes and our regulations has really been built to separate families and kind of maintain the separation. And so this focus on reunification is so critical um, because if, if by chance children and families are involved with child welfare, what we need to do is think about some really intentional ways about changing 
how we interact with parents who maybe had a challenge, a crisis, an experience that brought them to where they are connected to child welfare. But if we don't believe that people can change, then we shouldn't be in this work. And so how are we engaging with parents from the moment we are in communication and contact? How are we managing our own stuff, our own biases, our own perceptions about what families should look like, how they should be behaving? And how are we also continuing to challenge the mechanisms that we have in place in our system to actually ensure that they are moving towards being able to um, have an equity lens, treat families with dignity, even in crisis, to make decisions about children based on the individual circumstance, not our assumptions about community, not our assumptions about a group of people or what we would have liked for our children. Here's the reality. We have lots of data about outcomes and what happens when families get involved with child welfare. And the reality is the intervention for the most part doesn't yield better outcomes for children. And so that to me is evidence that we've got to keep kids and families out of this system and together and support working through challenges and crisis. But if involved with child welfare, we've got to actually focus on what are we front loading? What are we doing at those very initial first moments to really set the expectation to help create, generate hope? And, and to, in some ways, uh, it's the, the, the handling of this very important and critical relationship of parent-child that we should be honored to actually be engaged with and find ways with that parent, with the parents, with the family of how do we actually serve as a an asset, an added ingredient into helping them get to where they need to be so that they're able to um, be together and we are out of the picture all, all together. This includes asking people and talking to people about what is really important to them from their cultural perspective, from their family perspective around traditions, how are we engaging with relatives so that we can maybe minimize the, the distance between parent and child um, and relationship? How are we actually working with our resource parents and our foster parents to be partners with families with the end goal being helping them be whole again and step away from our historic role of separating and placing in different families and, um, and focusing only on the resource that goes there. How are we challenging our federal, state, and local investments to actually invest in what families need and what children need and what we need to be in the community to be able to support um, through, through crisis, through challenge, and all the circumstances that, that bring us to child welfare. And so we also have to be honest with ourselves about the impact that we have had and be able to with that, have intention about what is it that we need to do different and how do we get there? So it is individual based, it is team based, it is agency based and it's system based. It's with our court partners. 
it's with the attorneys, it's with the resource parents, it's with community partners, with our teachers and building this relationship and having conversations about what's working not and not working and figuring out how do we lessen the impact of separation and help support healing. The other part that I want to talk about is I had a chance yesterday to spend some time with some young people who um, were just full of wisdom <laughs> and um, insistence. And I continue in every time I have the opportunity to do that and to sit with parents, the, the wisdom and the perspective of even the most well-intended action and what that feels like and the result of it is, is so enlightening. And so we've actually, as a system, got to build that into our day-to-day -day work. And it's easy to say, maybe it's hard to do. I think it's only hard to do because we haven't been doing it. And that once we do it and build it in, then it just becomes the way we do our day-to-day -day work, the way in which we create um, the new paths that we wanna go and create opportunities for parents to talk to parents, young people to talk to young people. Cause let's be honest. I talk to someone who's had a similar experience to me or maybe came from a similar community much more comfortably than some stranger sitting in my living room, particularly when that stranger has the, the um, power to change my life forever and the life of my children. And so I think, I guess my challenge, and that's why I'm so excited to hear about the examples that are happening, is for us to, to not sit back and say, oh, we've, we've got reunification month, this is great. But what are we doing each and every month to continue to grow our capacity, our skill, and our ability to actually support families and children coming together, being together, if in foster care, bringing them back together and supporting so there so kids are not coming back so families are not coming back to be engaged with us and also focusing on what's actually needed so that families are not engaged with us at all as a child welfare system but may be engaged with us as community partners and um, are able to you know inform us with uh, you know, this is where an investment's needed. Oh, this was the experience that I realized was happening in my neighborhood. Some of the proactive things that I think we've got some opportunities to do differently. And part of, you know, some of that requires us to, you know, be really honest in our reflection about the impact our system has had and where some of our shortcomings are. But I am a true believer that change is possible it isn't it isn't easy it's not impossible i mean wait yes that's right it isn't easy and it's not impossible and it's absolutely what i expect us to be doing and i think the opportunity to identify new ways of doing this work absolutely is going to be driven by those who have experienced our system and how it hasn't worked. And then being models and coaches for all of us as we build towards something different. And so, you know, our commitment at the federal level is to continue to look for ways that we are also investing putting our money where our mouth is to continue to think about how do we um, both invest in prevention and preservation, but also how are we helping um, families and children get out um, from underneath the child welfare system and be together and be well in communities that are well. That also requires us to 
think about how are we partnering with the other systems at the federal level as well, education, housing, health, um, our labor department, all of our TANF um, teams. Families don't live in silos, our work lives in silos. And so what are we doing as these systems to kind of break down some of the, some of the walls and barriers that make it really hard for families to experience the resources and supports needed or even access them in the way that is needed um, by having to navigate all of these systems. I think that is one of our number one charges um, in leading these systems is to, to break down the barriers that exist, pull the threads and find out why isn't, why isn't it working in the way that maybe it was intended to do and figure out what is a different way and a different strategy. And that involves having folks letting us know what's working and not working and helping us find the blind spots. So in, in just in wrapping up, my uh, maybe call to action to all of you is don't be done. <laughs> don't be done with finding creative ways, finding collaborative coordinated ways to build towards a new way of serving children and families with the goal and the understanding that children do best in their families and in their communities. And we can't care about kids, can't care about those children if we're not caring about their parents or their families. And that's what we're called to do. And so we, our system isn't built to do that. That I believe is why we all got into this work. And so we've got to be doing both the, how are we engaging now? And how are we kind of pulling apart the parts and pieces of the system that have made it have the impacts that it's having and find ways that we're building something different um, and acknowledging the impact that we've had and, and not making excuses for it and knowing that we've caused harm um, to kids and families and we can actually um, create better ways, stronger ways that are actually creating ways to health and well-being for, for children and families and, um, and doing it together. So that's my call to action to all of you. I thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to offer remarks. Um, and I'm excited to, to hear and see the ongoing work that you're all doing. And I'll just also offer this. If there are things that you think are barriers and impediments to doing really good reunification work or really good preservation and prevention work, let me know. Let the federal team know, send it our way. We want, we want to know those things because by no means do we have a full understanding of the, of the breadth of the impact of, of some of the parts and pieces that exist. And so your input and your perspective will continue to help us best serve you as you're serving the communities that you're working with. So just thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you. Commissioner jones Gaskin, thank you so, so, so much for joining us and answering that call to come and speak with us. I know I, uh, on behalf of all of us, let me see it in the reactions. We thank you, we love you. We are inspired by your leadership and, and the call to action to not be done. I love that. Let's not be done. Let's all put as, um, as my ancestors would say, let's put our hands to the plow and get the work done. Um, and that I, I really, um, the challenge that you gave us all in identifying when we see those barriers to lift them up, um, how else are we going to be able to work to remove them if we don't shine a light on them? So we all thank you very much. Let me see it. Let me see those hearts and salutations. We are so very, very grateful. <clears throat> Losing my voice. Thank you. We are so very grateful that you were able to join us today. We appreciate you. We appreciate your leadership. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.
So everyone, we are here. We've got just a few more moments in our time together. Um, I want to make sure if there are any other questions um, out there that uh, I know I've got my colleagues, Jay and Chauncey have been monitoring your questions in the chats, in the Q&A. Uh, what are those questions? What, what remains? What, what don't we want to leave undone while we're here today, this afternoon? So we had a, a couple of uh, more questions that came in that we want. First of all, again, I just want to echo Thank you so much to uh, Commissioner Gaston. Uh, just an excellent job and a great uh, commentary for what we're doing here at Unification Month. Um, a couple of other questions. One was, what was the, what are the qualifications for your um, uh, parent partners? And, and there's a couple more, but I'll start with that one. Do you, anybody want to share a little bit about your qualifications for your parent partners? Um, for the Ohio Parent Partners, the key qualification is that they have lived experience, um, so mm -hmm. their child was in the custody of the children's, away from their custody, and they worked with the Children's Services System to reunify, and if they have reunified, that it's been at least a year since reunification before they um, are eligible to be hired as a parent partner. Um, that's, I mean, there's obviously, like, prohibiting offenses, like, serious crimes against children, things like that. Um, but, you know, several of our parent partners have crim drug criminal history, things like that. And that's not a barrier as long as those um, issues that are now resolved. Anything else on that with the qualification? Okay. I know um, someone asked, they asked also, do we have, or I think they were referring to like your parent partners, are you working with any parents that were formerly incarcerated and then working with them to help them towards reunification? Um, so the parent partners, I, I'm not sure if any of them have ever been to prison. I know some of them have spent some time in jail. Um, that are currently employed. So the to get referred to the program, um, it would just be an open case in the county of, you know, that one of the pilot counties where the child had been removed. So I'm not certain whether any of the people currently being served have a history of incarceration, but there's no reason why that, that population would be excluded. Um, they would be as eligible as anybody else for the program. Yeah, all of our interventions are around uh, those that are involved in the child welfare system at the time. So. They could have been incarcerated like, during that time as well. All right, just a couple of other questions. Uh, someone asked about the framework that you're using. Is there anything you want to talk about? I think you kind of went over an overview with anything more specific. You want to talk about the framework that you all are using? So I can actually put the link to Children and Families of Iowa in the chat. They are the purveyor of the model that we are using. Um, and I did see another program about like, how could this be implemented elsewhere? And so yes. they are, they really guided us through the process of how to kind of get this up and running in our state and probably would be the best source of, and they work with various other states and entities um, and would be a really good resource, I think, for, for people. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. So the only other question I have, and Jay, tell me if you see another one. Um, I think several people ask, um, will this uh, recording, this is wonderful, will it be available later on? And the answer is yes. So we will make this available in terms of the recording uh, and the PowerPoint. And it looks like we'll have some additional resources to share as well. So um, we'll have that available on the site. Um, we'll put my email address if you don't, if you're if you're on this webinar, you probably I'm probably on my list already, but we'll make sure you're fully aware of when this will be available. Uh, probably next week uh, that we'll have this available for you all. Um, that's all I see. Jay, was there anything else in the in the chat that I might have missed? Um, just uh, there was one question about just the general purpose of reunification month and also leaning mm -hmm. to Kentucky. But um, just like the commissioner said, I think, uh, and we just addressed this with the ABA, that Reunification Month started with a very strong parent voice to prevent removals and end those situations where there's removal, separations that we expedite and get these children back home where they want to be and where these parents are here for these parents, uh, for their families. 
Um, and that's critical. That's every moment, every legal decision-making moment, every court moment. And that's what drives us here and why we're doing these um, webinars. And so um, with that, just opening it up really quick, um, and I think it was directed towards Kentucky, how do you really think about reunification in that recovery court sense? And why is that so important? Well, I think that you know, reunification is always the goal. And as the commissioner said, you know, often our system is not built like that. So we want to ensure that we are walking alongside of the family and that we are helping, you know, take barriers away that it's preventing reunification. Um, we also feel like with our recovery court, we're seeing families weekly. We feel like, you know, we can, you know, move children back into the home quicker because we are here for them um, and can see them every week. And if they're struggling, we can walk alongside of them. Um, and help them with every, whatever's going on with them, whether that's to, you know, provide services in the home um, or to, you know, enhance the mental health services that they're getting or the substance abuse services that they're getting. Thank you all for your wonderful comments and participation with our webinar today. We have just a few um, additional information we would like to share with you. And Chante, I believe you're going to some additional information. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wanted. Yes. Um, I, I should actually introduce myself. I'm Chelsea Strong, everyone. I'm a, a training consultant in child welfare. I've been involved with this system for a very long time with my own lived experience in foster care, but was adopted out of the system, but just so happy uh, that it's and know that the appropriateness of celebrating and recognizing reunification as the first goal and the most achieved goal for young people in foster care. So um, one of the things I want to do as we wrap up is to let you all know that, you know, we're going to continue these celebrations moving forward. There's been so much good work done already on reunification month. We're going to put in the um, chat the website so that you can go to the site, stay uh, abreast of what's happening throughout the rest of this month. Uh, in the next at the, in the couple of days, but also throughout the year. The heroes are on the, the um, reunification website. We are actually um, going to continue with putting those on. We haven't even put them all, all, all on yet, and we're going to continue to uh, make you all aware when those new heroes are placed on the site. We've done some wonderful spotlights uh, for states that are doing great reunification work, including our, our friends in Hawaii and uh, New Jersey, Washington. I think we are going to highlight New York next. Um, the proclamations. I've been so excited. The number of states, and I think we're up to 12 now. I actually received something from my friends out in um, Nevada and Georgia, West Virginia, who actually have proclamations as well. So again, continuing to talk about the importance of Reunification Month through those proclamations. We'll go to the next slide. So here's where we are. Again, we want to make sure um, that if, you know, one, we're going to do this all year long. June is not the only time we should be talking about reunification. It should be every day all day as far as I'm concerned, because young people, when they can go home, they ought to go home and we should provide the services that will make that necessary. Um, uh, we have the events that are happening. So again, on the website, if you have events that are still happening, I actually have a couple of people who said their events are not gonna happen until July. Let us know about it. We still wanna share that on the website. So uh, you see here our email address, Beverly, and my email address, feel free to email us about events that are happening. Uh, we'll continue to post um, throughout the next few months throughout the year really about things that are happening around reunification. I'm so excited about that toolkit that we have with the social media toolkit uh, that's on the website. Uh, and then there's just resources, which is why we really want you to go to that website. If you are not on the list, if you're not sure if I have your name, feel free to just put it in the question and answers. We'll make sure that you have the information that you need to stay in, informed with Reunification Month and everything that's happening. So I want to thank you all so much. I'll stop talking right here, but I'm so glad you all would be a part of this uh, Reunification uh, webinar. Beverly? Thank you. On behalf of all of us at the ABA, Chauncey, our panelists from the QRC, um, have, and we were so um, enjoying having Commissioner Jones Gaskin. We thank you all for participating with us this afternoon. We encourage you all to continue to celebrate reunification, not only in the month of June, but all year long, and to partner with us as we continue to lift up the importance of family integrity, remembering that reunification matters and reunification happens. We thank you all. Thank you for joining us today.